Good morning. Welcome to our time of worship together. If you're here with us, would you like to be seated for a moment? Welcome to those who are worshipping with us online as well. As we gather, we acknowledge our indebtedness for having a facility and having the freedom to worship in this country. And we're grateful for those who've cared for this facility over the years. We're particularly grateful for those who care for this part of our land and have done over the generations for the Boonarong and Boorong people, the Kulin Nation. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We continue to affirm our commitment as part of the Christian church to see a better future from, for our First Peoples by listening well and working with them. Let's worship God. Let's hear some verses today from Lamentations 23. This I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. He will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. We're going to sing together a hymn that talks about the amazing love of God, immortal love forever full. unusual words to us, an older hymn, but it happened to be one that was quoted in something I was reading this week, and you will see um, part of it where it talks about Christ's presence with us in times of illness and God's closeness at that time comes out in what we're looking at today. Let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. We acknowledge, O oh God, the ease with which we can so easily be overwhelmed by life. We can so easily forget that your presence is with us. So many voices bombard our lives that we can fail to recognize your voice 
amidst them all. But when we remember your past dealings with your people, we recover our confidence to trust you in the present and in the future. Your steadfast love resonates through the witness of lives touched by your grace. Love and grace experienced by hearing your word clearly spoken by Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, O oh God, for your faithfulness to us. We praise you, O oh God, as the one who constantly watches over us, knowing us more fully than any human being can ever know us and loving us intensely. We praise you, O oh God, for your power, power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and for the wonder of your mercy and grace towards us. We pray, O oh God, that this time of worship may truly reflect our praise and our thanksgiving for all you are and all you mean to us. Lord Jesus Christ, you used your hands to heal and to lift up, to bless, to sow kindness and tenderness in desolate lives. Forgive us when we keep our hands at our sides, when we could be reaching out in love. Lord Jesus Christ, you use your hands to bear the burdens of others, to feed the hungry. Forgive us when we use our hands to take care of ourselves without any thought for those who are hungry or overwhelmed by adversity. Lord Jesus Christ, you use your hands to welcome and to include those who are considered outcasts in the society of your time. Forgive us when we clench our fists and exclude people simply because they are different from us. Lord Jesus Christ, open our hands and our hearts to love as you loved and to care as you cared. Strengthen us to include in our prayers and our fellowship those who might feel excluded because of things such as race or religion or sexuality or gender or age or handicap, whatever it is that creates barriers between us. Lord Jesus Christ, help us to accept people as you accept them, as people made in the image of God and precious to God. We ask you, O oh God, to cleanse and transform us that our attitudes may better reflect the attitudes that Jesus has shown to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We hear the good news of Jesus, that in Christ there is forgiveness and steadfast love, that God saves and rescues us, and that we recognise God's goodness and grace to us day by day. And so we are thankful. Let's sing together the hymn, Come Holy Spirit, Come.
We're going to have our Bible reading in a moment. Theo was going to bring that to us, but unfortunately he is unwell today and Joan has um, stepped in for him. Thank you, Joan. Our reading today is from Mark 5, verses uh, 21 to 43. Jairus's daughter and the woman who touched Jesus' cloak. Jesus went back to the other side of the lake. There, at the lakeside, a large crowd gathered around him. Jairus, an official of the local synagogue, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he threw himself down at his feet and begged him earnestly, my little daughter is very sick, please come and place your hands on her so that she will get well and live. Then Jesus started off with him. So many people were going along with Jesus that they were crowding him from every side. There was a woman who had suffered terribly from severe bleeding for 12 years, even though she had been treated by many doctors. She had spent all her money, but instead of getting better, she got worse all the time. She had heard about Jesus, so she came in the crowd behind him, saying to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I will get well. She touched his cloak, and her bleeding stopped at once, and she had the feeling inside herself that she was healed of all her trouble. At once, Jesus knew that power had gone out of him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? His disciples answered, You see how the people are crowding around you? Why do you ask who touched you? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. The woman realized what had happened to her, so she came, trembling with fear, knelt at his feet and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, My daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your trouble. While Jesus was saying this, some messengers came from Jairus' house and told him, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? Jesus paid no attention to what they had said, but told him, don't be afraid, only believe. Then he did not let anyone else go on with him except Peter and James and his brother John. They arrived at Jairus' house where Jesus saw the confusion and heard all the loud crying and wailing he went in and said to them, Why all this confusion? Why are you crying? The child is not dead. She is only sleeping. They started making fun of him. So he put them all out, took the child's father and mother and his three disciples and went into the room where the child was lying. He took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means Little girl, I tell you to get up. So she got up at once and started walking around. She was 12 years old. When this happened, they were completely amazed. But Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone. And he said, give her something to eat. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, we give thanks. When we hear the statement, I'm sorry, there's no hope, no hope of recovery, no viable solution, no possibility of repair, we find these words devastating. Thornton Wilde tells us that hope is the projection of the imagination 
and so is despair. Despair all too readily embraces all the ills that it foresees. Hope is an energy that arouses the mind to explore every possibility to combat them. In response to hope, the imagination is aroused to picture what it can do, to try every door, to fit together the most unusual pieces of the puzzle. And then after it's found a solution, often it's difficult to go back and see the steps that were taken along the way. They were taken in a level of unconsciousness. The author of the book of Hebrews said, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Today, these two stories could have a theme like there may yet be hope. It's never too late for Jesus. Jesus used the phrase, fear not, which was commonly used in the Hebrew scriptures when people encountered the presence of God to seek to put them at ease and to remind them that God gives life, saves life, sustains life. Not even death makes it too late to have hope in God. This synagogue leader, Jairus, acts in a most undignified way in his part of the story when he comes and pleads with Jesus and comes out of his desperate need. Each of the people in the story, in fact, come to Jesus in desperation. The woman had run out of options. She was exhausted. She'd used, exhausted all the usual means of gaining help. And in the process, she became poor. And her illness, in fact, far from getting better, was getting worse. It's a picture of desperation. Both the stories paint for us a picture of desperation and fear, but also a picture of faith and the power of Jesus to take people from fear to faith. The two stories work together and illuminate one another. And Voskamp has said, faith is always a way of seeing things, a seeking for God in the midst of everything. And if our eyes gaze long enough to see God lifted up in the midst of a thing, then our lips can thank him. The truly saved have eyes of faith and lips of thanks. Faith is in the gaze of the soul. And Tom Wright, in reflecting on this particular passage, says, when life crowds in with all its pressures, there's still room for us to creep up behind Jesus. If, even if that's all we feel that we can do and reach out to him in that odd sort of mixture of fear and faith that so characterizes our discipleship as followers of Jesus. These familiar stories encourage us in the midst of our fears that we can look to Jesus and even in the most difficult of circumstances, God can work and bring hope. God can give us encouragement and a new perspective. And God can act unpredictably and in miraculous ways. The woman exhibited a mixture of desperation and hope and fear and expectation as she came to Jesus and sought Jesus' help. Her perpetual uncleanness with all the consequences within her family and with her social life explains how she would have been fearful both for requesting help and even when she received it, to accept and to acknowledge that she had received it. Her fear was prompted by all she'd experienced in the past, and it's consistent with anyone being in the presence of God. The situation of this woman was completely turned around by Jesus. It's obvious and understandable that she may feel overwhelmed by this, and a sense of reverent fear in God's presence, in the presence of Jesus, the one who changed her life, is understandable. Joseph Suenz was a very progressive cardinal in the Catholic Church, very strongly involved in Vatican II. He said, I am a man of hope, not for human reasons, nor for any natural optimism, but because I believe the Holy Spirit is at work in the church and in the world, even when we may not hear the name of the Holy Spirit acknowledged. The story of the raising of Jairus's daughter 
also prompts other reflections in our minds. It, in, it, it prompts us to reflect on our own mortality. It confronts us with our mortality and our reactions when we're confronted by death or by the imminent death of someone that we love. Lamer Williamson in recognising this says, this text intends to affirm that even in the presence of death itself, real death, it may be seen as just sleep in the presence of Jesus. Both Jairus and the woman in this story use an interesting word when they come to Jesus seeking help. They use the word Greek word sozo as they come to him, which is usually translated save, but here it's translated make well or heal. It may point to a sense that they felt there was no further hope Nothing could be done for them. They were at the end of the te their tether. They were beyond cure. Yet they would try this one last thing. They would try and seek some miraculous intervention. It may also point to the fact that they received something that was far bigger than just physical recovery. Something that was more about wholeness and salvation. In Jesus coming into this picture and encountering these people, he put himself open to being highly criticised, even ostracised by his actions. Contact with a dead person or contact with someone who is unclean was seen as a cause of impurity in the Jewish temple system. And Jesus could have reaped consequences for his actions here. But he insisted on personal contact. He came in that situation where the woman had touched him and said, who touched me? In the midst of a crowd, it seemed a ridiculous question. How could they answer? Everyone was probably touching him. But Jesus couldn't allow this woman to go unnoticed. She couldn't recede into the crowd. She couldn't go away with superstitious or magical ideas of what might have happened to her. He stopped and looked intently around the people he wanted to know who it was that had touched him, who had that expectation of his saving power. And in his conversation with her, he declares that healing and peace have indeed come to her. She'd felt better from touching him, but this involves something even greater, a greater measure of wholeness. The concept of peace carries with it the meaning of a profound sense of well-being. And it's related to that concept of salvation. So as she came to Jesus, she was experiencing something grand, experiencing wholeness in a way she may never have experienced it before. And then he goes on and addresses her as daughter. Such a term of familial endearment, a term which reinforces the closeness of the relationship now between her and Jesus. In the whole of this scenario, Jesus is demonstrating the healing power of God and it points to a reality that he is beginning to bring about something remarkable in the world by his presence. Jesus is on his way to confronting evil at its very heart. He will meet death itself, which threatens the whole of God's created order, the whole of God's beautiful creation, and he will defeat it in a way as unexpected as perhaps these two incidences and their resolutions. The story of the raising of Jairus's daughter reinforces Jesus' power over death and over unbelief. Through his actions, Jesus demonstrates the fact that healing reflects the presence of God amongst them and God's saving power there. Jesus' saving, healing presence demonstrates that God's kingdom is close, very near. Now, stories of healing can raise stark questions for us in the realities of our daily life. Why are some healed and others aren't? Why are some given a second chance at life and others aren't? Why can children die unexpectedly? And we have no answers for such questions. But these stories and our modern day stories point us to the reality that the presence of God can be with us in any situation. 
and can bring hope even in the midst of despair and desperation. We get, began today by considering the words of Thornton Wilde that both hope and despair are projections of our imagination. And it points to the concept that we have some measure of control over where our imagination chooses to focus. Paul wrote about the peace of God guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and about focusing our minds on whatever is true and lovely and noble, right and pure and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. These sorts of practices can help us to keep God before us in the midst of whatever it is that we're encountering so that we can turn to God in prayer in all the events of our lives. Tom Wright has said, you practice the virtue of hope through worship and prayer, through invoking the one God, through reading and reimagining the scriptural story, through consciously holding the unknown future within the unshakable divine promises. Through consciously holding the unknown future within the unshakable divine promises. When we face particularly challenging times, his words that I quoted earlier can be helpful to us. When life crowds in with all its pressures, there's still room for us to creep up behind Jesus if that's all we can do and reach out to him and touch him in that odd mixture of fear and faith that characterizes our Christian discipleship. Amen. Reflecting on the closeness of Jesus to us in all times of our lives, let's sing how sweet the name of Jesus sounds. We come to our time for notices and I know Dick has something to share with us in a moment. Just a reminder that we have um, um, Maggie Younger's memorial service here on Tuesday at 11 a.m. That service is, is being held here. This is one of the communities of which she was a strong part and she was also a strong part of the Church of Christ community and so John Sharp will be leading that service. 
I'd also been informed during the week of the death of Nancy Fife, who some various ones of you probably know, and uh, her funeral is in the midst of being planned and is likely to be here possibly even at the end of this week. If it is at the end of this week, we'll send out a, an email giving details of that. Ken Parker is going to lead that service here. Um, I don't think that I have any other announcements, but we do have... Oh, yes, of course, I had one more. And that is that the, um, we had talked to church council about using this particular Sunday as a day where we have a retiring offering for the Uniting Church Share Winter Appeal. We usually do that during the course of the year. We re recognise that it may not have been in the newsletter and therefore um, you might not be, have come prepared for that and still want to contribute to it. There will be a bowl just outside in the, the area, just outside the concertina doors after the service if you're wanting to contribute today. If you want to do so in the, on the next Sunday, just put an envelope with that name on the front of it in the offering and we'll make sure that it gets into that appeal as well. Thank you. Dick has some things to share with us. Talking of hope and talking of helping people who bring hope to others, uh, the share appeal is one of the things we ought to be thinking about, but some of us also contribute to the uh, Missionary Aviation Fellowship. Now, they've just sent me a show bag of stuff and I want to share, and I'll be putting it out for people to have a look at uh, afterwards. But the MAF over a long period has been doing terrific uh, work by flying in and out of all sorts of areas and uh, doing great work for people who are ne never going to get help anywhere else, no matter what uh, is going on, uh, particularly over, we've seen just recently in New Guinea, the uh, terrible uh, landslide that killed so many. Nobody knows how many yet and may never know. So the work of the MAF has gone on, not just in Australia, it goes on through Africa and America and it's been going on and it's interesting, I've been, this book is part of it and I'd love to share it, I've still not finished it, um, but the, what, what happened over time in three or four different countries, then began to see, uh, particularly at just before and just after the Second World War, the potential for using the plane to help people and to spread the gospel. And the book tells the story and some, it, it has some wonderful stories in it of what, what happened uh, with it. So, some of us do um, make regular donations to MAF and if you want to be part of that, please let me know. I'll be very happy to include you in that. The other thing is that for those who perhaps can't, don't, don't feel that they're able to do that on some regular basis, there's a note here, and I've got a little cardboard money box here. For every $50 we give, they can get a jerry can of fuel. And so we can donate some jerry cans of fuel if that's what you want to be doing. And if you have uh, funds that you want to use in that way, let me know again, because we'll make sure that, that that's done too. So I encourage you to have a look at this material, which I'll have out there in the uh, friendship room afterwards. But can I read you a story first before I finish up? Because this I thought was a chap who became later a part of not just Missionary Aviation Fellowship, but it talks about all the different groups, the Salvation Army, the Anglicans, the, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, using planes throughout Australia. But this, this is the uh, story of a chap who later got involved, but it tells us that in uh, he was a home missioner, and uh, before his 21st birthday, he'd already been through mission, missionary college and was out working. Uh, 
because he'd been encouraged by the Reverend Rex Dakers. Some of us might remember him. Uh, he was a character in himself. Um, he used to ride a little Velocet motorbike. For those men who remember little Velocets, that little silver motorbike, were great machines uh, with a few problems, particularly loss of fuel if you didn't turn the petrol off when you stopped riding. But this is the story here, and I'd love to read it to you. Um, this is a fellow called Don McCaskill. Uh, he was appointed as a home missioner to a church up in Mansfield in the foothills of the Victorian high country. Initially, Don carried out his duties with only a bicycle for transport, but soon he deemed it necessary to invest in a motorcycle a 350cc Velocet. Given that his preaching circuit included places like the Ptolemy Ranges and even Mount Buller when it had a timber mill there. Everything needed for the conduct, conduct of church was carried on the Velocet, including a canvas bag of hymn books strapped to his chest and a portable organ on his back. I thought you might be encouraged by that <laughs> to uh, understand, but later this man also became, uh, I told Pam, he, he ended up after that at Omeo and did the same thing with his little motorbike at Omeo. But when the war came, uh, the day after the declaration of war, he took off on his Velocet to Melbourne and enlisted in the, uh, ambulance and and it was at that point that he was involved in the air ambulance that used during the war and he was in New Guinea and it was then that he got the idea that the plane should be used for spreading the gospel and helping people in need and it's a, it's a great story have we got time for one other story about Rex Dakers and his his uh, <laughs> Sorry, Rex Dakers in his little Velocet motorbike. I said one of the problems with the Velocet was that it leaked petrol. Now, Rex Dakers was a great Methodist minister, terrific bloke, uh, been a prisoner of war as a chaplain. In, and when after the war, he, he'd been a boxer and he had the chaps up boxing in the prisoner of war camp, trying to build uh, interest and keep things running. And uh, when he returned, he was posted to the Mallee, and he had a little Velocet that was his method of getting around. And uh, the story goes from the men up there that one Sunday Rex was uh, preaching at a particular place and uh, he sort of lost, a, got a little bit punchy for those who'd understand boxing uh, during the, his time in the prisoner of war camp and uh, he was halfway through the service and thought to himself, oh gosh, did I really switch off the petrol on my bike? I might go out and find I haven't got any petrol left. So he called for a moment of silent prayer <laughs> while he went out to check his motorbike. But as I say, his mind was not great at the time. And uh, the people in the service heard the motorbike start up <laughs> and him drive away. He'd forgotten that he'd left them in the moment of prayer. <laughs> but he was the man who inspired the chap we've just been reading about to become a home missioner. Yeah. Thanks. If I have silent prayer, I won't pin it out. <laughs> leave you, sorry. Yeah. Um, we come to a time of prayer for others. And as uh, David Evans writes in the hymn, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord, he writes, Be still for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. He comes to cleanse and heal, to minister his grace. No works too hard for him in faith receive from him and in that belief 
we, sh we shall pray for others. Let us pray. Let us focus as we come in prayer and be still. We notice a breath, a breath as it, we breathe, that God, you gave this to us. It's focusing on the air, breathe, breath coming in and out. Help, or make, help us to be aware of God's presence and be still and know the presence of his power. Father who created our world, who made the universe, we bring before you our concerns for the world, our country and our community. <coughs> We are assured by your promise that whatever we ask in Jesus' name, you shall listen to. We pray for the unrest in the world, the conflicts in the Gaza and Ukraine and other parts of the world. <coughs> we pray for peace for people living in war-torn countries, in a world that's been turned upside down. Where violence tears families apart. We pray for those who are grieving, for family members they have lost in the conflicts throughout the world. We pray for those who are physically and mentally injured by war and civil conflicts. Lord, we look on as we see people in other countries and our own country who have taken up sides in the Israel-Gaza conflict and used it as a racist slur on other people. Help them to see the love in every person, regardless of race. We pray for the countries around the world who are coming into elections, that the elections may be fair and a true representation of what people want. We pray that election times may be a time of peace and not conflict. We pray for our country. We pray for the homeless, those struggling in financial hardship. We pray for those who have no shelter in this cold weather. Give them a shelter and help us to reach out to them. We pray for those on school holidays, that it may be a time of refreshment and fun. We pray that we keep, you keep travellers safe, those on school holidays and those we know who are travelling. We pray for our community, for those who are sick, awaiting medical tests or have had surgery, that they may be healed and comforted. We pray for those grieving, that they will be comforted. We remember the poor, that those with more resources may reach out and help them. We bring before you in silence those who care about, we care about, and bring them before you.
Lord, help us to go from this place and do your will and be ambassadors in the world. We let go of our burdens with the assurance that they will be in your hands. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And we continue by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We come now to acknowledge the gifts that have been brought into the life of our church community in physical form today in particular, but also those that have been given electronically in recent times. So um, Rhoda and Kevin are going to bring those forward for us now. Would you like to stand as we do this? And as we do, we acknowledge our indebtedness and thankfulness to God and our commitment of ourselves and all that we have to God. Gracious God, receive and bless these gifts and our lives, which we offer in response to your steadfast love, which is revealed so clearly to us in Jesus. In his life and death and resurrection, he shows us the depths of your love. We thank you, O oh God, as transformed people for the healing power of your love. May our lives continue to be transformed through the, your, your gifts to us. And we bring these gifts to you that they may be used for your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So let's sing together the hymn, O Christ the Healer, we have come.
So as we conclude our worship today, we acknowledge that you may have come with some concerns or joys particularly on your minds, or something may have been raised in the course of our service. If you would like someone to pray with you or offer you a blessing, Andrew and Nancy will be at the front here after the service, and please feel free to come and share with them. So as we go, may we go confident in the knowledge of God's steadfast love holding us, assured of the healing touch of Jesus upon our lives, and emboldened by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's transforming power. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, and may you abound in hope in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest on us now and always. Amen.